Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com here. It is Tuesday, the 30th of May, 2023, and it's time for the weekly discussion, soon to be the daily discussion, or at least pretty close to daily. And I want to talk today about, are we going to have a big hurricane season or not? These forecasts that have come out recently, some of them suggesting a very robust season. We're going to look at a couple of the reasons behind why we are seeing some very aggressive forecasts and some fairly anemic forecasts, meaning yeah, we're not going to have too much of a big hurricane season. But those forecasts are all about numbers, right? How many name storms, how many hurricanes, how many major hurricanes, hurricane days, you know, how many days do we have a hurricane on the map, that kind of thing. None of these forecasts are very good yet at telling us about impacts. Where will anything that does develop end up? And what will it be like when it gets there? Are we talking about a whole bunch of depressions, which can bring a bunch of rain? Of course, those are impacts, rain is. Or a slew of Category 4 or 5s, like we saw in 2005. And in 2020, a whole bunch of activity, especially in the Gulf of Mexico. Pinning down those details, that is impossible this time of year. There's different folks that have given it a try, maybe for certain regions that could be impacted. But again, that doesn't tell us when we could expect something and exactly what those impacts could be. So just keep that in mind, all right? All right, let's take a look at what we do know. And that is, according to Dr. Phil Klotzbach here, this is a great tweet in this graphic that he shows, quite the spread in Atlantic seasonal hurricane forecasts submitted by, count them folks, 23 different groups huh, to his seasonalhurricanepredictions.org. Great website there, right? Forecasts range from below average to well above average. And I remember just a few weeks ago, you might remember this as well, the University of Arizona led the pack early with a very aggressive forecast of about 19 name storms, if I'm not mistaken. And then just a few days ago, while I was out in the Great Plains doing some testing of our new Starlink, I'm going to talk about that a different day. Today we're going to focus on the tropics. But I was out there with my partner, CJ, and the UK Met information came out of a hyperactive season. In fact, the ceiling, in other words, the top of the possible ACE, accumulated cyclone energy, that the UK Met products and how they derive everything came up with was 306, with a most likely, if I remember correctly from what I saw, of 222. That's kind of like saying, uh, what will LeBron James score in tonight's game or whatever, whenever that is, and someone says, well, he's likely to score 137 points or something. It was just insane. 306 for the ace on the high end with the most likely on the UK Met forecast, a little bit over 220. Normally, our ace score is about 100, 105, somewhere around there, depending on which metrics you look at. So, wow. So what's the culprit? Why are we looking at such discrepancies here with these forecasts and can we wrap our brain around anything to where we could actually have something meaningful to look forward to in terms of what to expect because we all want at least a little bit of certainty in our lives I get that this is gonna be hard so let's take a little bit of a deep dive here and see what's going on first of all let's zoom in on the graphic real quick alright so the UK Met office pretty high right up here let's use a color little pop I guess red will stick out pretty good. There's the UK Met on the high side. Um, then you've got like 268 weather over here. I don't know who they are. That's okay. It doesn't mean that they're not worthy of looking at. Uh, there's, there's the University of Arizona. That's pretty high up there. Um, North Carolina State University, not real aggressive on theirs, just an example. So the greens are your university. Your purples, by the way, are your private entities. And then the blues are the government agencies, the deep state. No, I'm just kidding. It's podcast for another day or whatever. Sorry. Hey, I'm trying to make this whatever, a little bit easier to digest. Uh, so you can get the idea here. There's a flurry of some of these that are pretty aggressive. Uh, some aren't. Yeah, so why? What's the reason behind it? Well, the biggest thing is the El Nino and the warm Atlantic dual there and we're going to get to that in just a second but here is again a look at the UK Met this is this came out the other day I was just like 
are you serious? Like, is there a mistake? Did somebody hit send on something they shouldn't have? They're calling for 20 name storms. That's the most likely in their range there. 11 hurricanes and five major hurricanes. Their biggest reasoning, at least what they say in their write-up about it, they don't just put these graphics out and then just let them sit out there like scary memes or something. They have a reason behind this stuff, okay? And they're citing that the El Nino won't have as big of an influence, primarily because the Atlantic is so overwhelmingly warm compared to average. So the relative strength of the El Nino is not really there, because everything is stronger, so to speak, uh, or anomalously warmer, if you will. The, the indicators are more overwhelming in the Atlantic than the El Nino to thwart that and keep the Atlantic down. Um, and then they talk about lower wind shear in the Caribbean, especially the deep tropical Atlantic into the Caribbean. They are looking at lower wind shear values than what we would typically think of seeing during an El Nino year. So five major hurricanes, this is what this graphic shows here. That's concerning, it is, because your major hurricanes are responsible for 80% of the damage historically that comes from tropical cyclones. But please, please, please do keep in mind impacts range, of course, from rain to wind to storm surge. You know, tornadoes are even part of hurricanes in their right front quadrant usually. There's a lot more to it than these numbers right here, no matter who they are from. So that, that's what we need to focus on is the impact. These forecasts are interesting, but what do they mean? You know, they don't mean anything unless something actually comes to you in terms of how you should look at this. And I talk about this often. Think of it selfishly. That's okay. How will this impact me? What do these numbers mean to me? Well, they really don't mean anything to you personally until something arrives, if it does at all. And so that's what we need to think about in the longer term. All right? So again, what are the reasons behind this sort of weird situation where we don't really know well, we never really know, right? Look at last year. But these contrasting indicators. Let's take a look. All right, We've been watching this for weeks here. Even at the end of last year, we were watching how warm the Atlantic was getting, the possibility of El Nino developing. I wasn't sold on it early on, and it took some time. And, well, there it is. So it's easier to be sold on something when it's right in front of you, right? But, yes, there's the developing El Nino, the anomalous warming of the tropical Pacific, this typically creates more rising air. That air likes to spread out and sink into the Caribbean and the uh, western parts of the main development region through here, basically typically making this area unfavorable for tropical waves to develop, typically. But what if this signal overrides this signal? Because this is a very warm AMO look, the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation all the way through the Caribbean. That's a very classic look to an active hurricane season. Our cold PDO, it's cold over on the west coast of the United States and in the eastern Pacific, that cold PDO eroding a little bit from the north up here, but still there. And so it's a very, like, hmm, I don't know what to expect kind of a look. So we really need to see how does this progress over time and does this hold on as we get through the next several months, especially, of course, August, September, October. This is the subsurface. I showed you this last week. I've been keeping an eye on this. This is that same map that I just showed you. If you took a slice through it and then looked at it and said, what's the profile from the top of the ocean here to several hundred meters deep down here? Your warmth there in the subsurface is prevalent, but as I pointed out last week, this isn't that angry looking or aggressive. There's not more of this waiting over here. This, this area of really high anomaly values, four or five degrees Celsius warmer than average, is confined to the eastern Pacific right now. And there's not much of an impetus to get it to come to the surface and then spread out like warm butter on warm toast. A great analogy there. There's just not a lot of that happening. The easterlies are still kind of going strong. In other words, the El Nino hasn't really kicked into high gear. There's parts of it that are there, but the whole thing hasn't been built yet. Think about it like a car or anything that you're assembling. Some of the pieces are there. Others are still missing. This is a great tool here, the Hovmolars. This is 
And this is really telling. I also showed this recently. So these are your winds at 5,000 feet, your zonal wind anomalies from the past 30th of April to the future, out to mid-June. These blues are all anomalous easterly winds where? From 120 degrees west, as I mark it up here, all the way over to 120 degrees east. That's pretty much the entirety of the tropical Pacific. So, yeah, easterly winds coming in, that's not going to help El Nino. Your westerly winds are way over here, much farther away from the Inso regions. And so that's really, you know, that's mid-June there that we're still not seeing a strong westerly wind burst like these colors in here. That's what helped to kick off the Inso warming, the El Nino warming that we have now. Meanwhile, all this time, not very strong trades across the Atlantic. This is your zonal area of the Atlantic. 60 degrees west, that's just east of the islands, right? Not much in the way of easterlies in here at all. Just a little bit, these light blues. Even some anomalous westerly winds. That's what these colors show here. All right, so the Atlantic has warmed. Should continue to at least maintain this look as we don't have strong trades just blasting across, mixing everything up, blowing Saharan dust and all that out there. Yeah, we're still going to have Saharan air layer events, but it's getting kind of late now for the El Nino to really kick in and shut everything down. But doesn't matter. Look at this. I saw this as I was preparing things. It kind of snuck past me. These disturbances can come quick. Um, and even though it might not be a named storm or whatever, what I'm going to show you here, you've probably already seen it on social. You're, you're ahead of things. You keep a watch on this stuff, I'm sure. But there it is. We got these disturbances down there right in the area where we would be watching this time of year, climatologically speaking. This is generally where we monitor for activity at the very end of May going into the start of hurricane season, which begins Thursday. So what do we got? What is this down here? What do we need to know about it? First, it's a surface trough, meaning just an area along the surface of the ocean, actually a few thousand feet up. But nevertheless, they call it a surface trough. So it's an area where the air is coming together, basically. A little bit lower pressure, and it's linear. It's not focused and bundled like a tropical wave. And it's got a very low chance of going on to develop into a named storm or a depression or anything like that. But, 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 I keep saying this. Don't worry about that part. What you need to know, if you're in Florida, especially, the impacts. What's going to happen from this? So instead of, oh, Bob, it's only got a 20% chance of developing doing anything, don't worry about it. Everybody's overhyping it. No, 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 no. Don't look at it that way. Look at it as, hey, Bob, it looks like there's some weather coming our way for the weekend. Oh, yeah, from what? Well, there's this surface trough out there. You can be very intelligent sounding by knowing what you're talking about. Impacts, that's what's coming towards Florida this weekend, as the scientists at the National Hurricane Center point out. All right, so it says right there, the system is forecast to move across the Florida Peninsula this weekend and emerge into the southwestern Atlantic Ocean by next week. Regardless of development, the system could produce heavy rainfall. Ding, 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 right? Gusty winds, that affects boaters, people on the beach, so forth and so on. School is starting to end. People are heading down there. I am heading down there. I'll talk about that in a minute. And it's going to be interesting Thursday, start of hurricane season. So just be aware of it. There it is, right there. That is bigger than me. It's bigger than you. I, I say this often, too. The weather is always bigger than us. I don't care what label we give it. Tropical storm, hurricane, category five. I don't want to say who cares because yes, it does matter, but we got to watch that feature. That's going to head towards Florida, generally speaking, and somewhere along here could have some inclement, squally weather as we approach the weekend. Now, looking at it on the vorticity side, there is some energy down there, but it is spread out. It's not too bundled or focused. That's a little bit more focused right there off of the Carolina coast, but going back to the satellite animation, this is very broad and spread out. What we're looking for to see, and this will happen later in the season, you know it's coming, is these areas of heat and energy that bundle up and focus that energy and take advantage of the ripe conditions that are prevalent down there, mainly the very warm sea surface temperatures. And we just don't see that yet. 
But we'll keep an eye on this, and you folks down in Florida need to watch it as well. And I'm just going to talk about that real quick. Start of hurricane season is coming up. On Thursday, I will be in southwest Florida at Fort Myers Beach. That was essentially ground zero for some of the worst of Ian's impacts last year. I will be joining Fox Weather live, Amy Freeze and Robert Ray. Uh, you're going to love this. I'm going to tune in. You should tune in. I'll be tuning in, too, in person. I'll be there to help make it happen, but we got to watch that feature. It might rain on us. We'll see. That's going to make it interesting. But, yes, the start of hurricane season, we will be talking about some of the technology that we use to get in front of hurricane impacts using camera systems like that guy right there behind me. You're aware of what we do, I'm sure. So that's going to be this Thursday, the start of hurricane season from one of the areas that was hardest hit by Ian. Tune in, Fox Weather, get the app, and um, check it out. It's going to be live Thursday. Got to watch and see. Do we need the rain slickers or the sunglasses or both? You never know in Florida, right? All right, so this is what it looks like from the GFS perspective. Not much there. This is the 5,000-foot level. By the way, this is a computer model version of this. This is energy in the atmosphere or vorticity. This is also vorticity, but this is the computer model, the GFS. Not much with it, and it really doesn't do much over the next several days, as I will show you as we move this out into time. In fact, it never really even makes it to Florida. It kind of winds up up here towards the northern Gulf Coast. That's 48 hours out. So we'll just watch, just generally speaking, a large area of cyclonic turning out here. Just disturbed weather in the Gulf, convection, showers, thunderstorms, squally weather, oil interest in some of the portions of the Gulf where that happens. Anybody out there with boating and leisure uh, time, hey, good for you. But you got to watch this, okay? you got to watch this feature because it is out there. This is 72 hours, 4 days, 96 hours. Again, not really focusing much. Upper level winds kind of strong. I can show you that. Hey, prove it. Show me those upper level winds. Well, let me find it. Uh, upper level winds, 200 millibar winds, oh yeah, cutting across, pretty strong across that area, there's a trough right there, yeah, this is why we don't get much activity this time of year, now there's an area that's favorable right there, but there's nothing moving into that area to take advantage of it, that's how that works, generally speaking, alright, I talked about this on Twitter, and several people responded, I appreciate that, hurricane tracking map, do it on paper, it is big, it's a poster, seriously, it's 20 by 28 inches, and um, it's full color. It's this year's map. You might track, according to the UK Met, 20-something of them, right? Get a 20 names dorms on that thing. Go to the link that I'm going to put in today's description. You can get one. I've only printed about 100 of these or something like that. Might have even only been 75 this year. They're expensive. It's actually about $400. I kid you not to print these because it's a low quantity of a high-quality piece of paper. If I printed 5,000 of them, it would only be like $500. You know, you know like it's, it's a weird way that works with paper. But I'm not going to sell 5,000 of them. That would be great. I'd have a little extra funding for some stuff. But anyway, we sell some to those that want them. We do give them to one of the tiers on our Patreon. But uh, it's a really neat thing. It's a paper map, the old school way. And you can get yours. It's only 20 bucks, and I do send it to you. Um, you know, via mail, and now I have some tubes, some mailing tubes that somebody sent me. Thank you, Brent. So I'll send it to you in a nice tube to keep it nice and crinkle free. All right? All right. So go to the link there, check it out, and get yours. And when they're gone, they're gone. That's it. I didn't print 5,000 of them. I did back in the day. I used to print these by the millions when we would give them away for free from Lowe's and different TV stations that I used to work with way back in the early part of my career. Story for another day. All right, like and share, as they say on the old YouTube there. Hit subscribe for me and um, become a follower of what we do. I don't know how else to put it. Algorithms. We're all driven in an algorithm world, right? But it's great to have you tuning in. Algorithms getting you here or not is good to have you. I do appreciate it. I hope you learned something. Season starts Thursday. I travel tomorrow. Get down to Florida. Again, Fox Weather Thursday morning. 9 to noon, I'll be on several times with Amy Freeze and Robert Ray. They will have other guests as well as we get ready for this big hurricane season or not. You like how I close that out? Not bad. All right. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. Again, thanks for tuning in. I am Mark Suttoth. I'll see you next from Southwest Florida.